Uh, Mossman Council recognises three traditional inhabitants of this land on which we are meeting, I'm meeting at Mossman, including the Borrig Eagle and Kammer Eagle people, and pays respects to their elders past and present and to their heritage. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this National Science Week author evening. We're really pleased to have Professor Mark Colliven, Professor of Philosophy at University of Sydney, to talk about his topic, Living in a Fine-Tuned Universe, a User's Guide. Please enjoy, and I'll hand over to Mark. Thank you. Thanks very much, Therese. And thanks to all of you for tuning in this evening. I, I normally say for a talk like this, jump in if I say something that's confusing or you'd like me to elaborate, but it's a little bit difficult to do that via Zoom. So I'll just push forward. And I'm not sure of the background of everyone. So I'll assume that most people at least don't know much of the relevant physics and probability theory and the like. So it's not a, there's a, not a lot of technical material here, but I'll... I'll you know, forgive me if I sound like I'm um, going a little bit too slowly for some of you. Okay, so let's start with design arguments in general. And the earliest of these are biological design arguments. So suppose you found a watch in a field. You wouldn't conclude that the forces of nature produced the watch. Rather, you would note that this is an intricate ob object uh, with a very specific purpose and it's therefore must have been designed or left by someone. So even if you didn't know what this was, suppose you're, you're, you're you know, living in some uh, remote primitive tribe, you've never seen a watch before, you find this thing, you're still inclined to think this, whatever it is for, it must have a specific purpose. I know not what that is, but it must have been made by someone. Whatever this is, it couldn't have been built by natural forces. But so the, this argument goes, I'm just presenting this argument without endorsement for the moment. But much of the natural world is like this watch. We find intricate structures apparently designed for very specific purposes. The classic example one would find in the literature here is the human eye very much like a camera, you found a camera lying in a field, you think it must have been designed and a human eye is very much like a camera. So summarizing this line of thought, the so-called natural world is intricate and seems geared towards specific purposes. Therefore, it's implausible that this is the result of natural processes. And so it's thus proposed that there must be a designer, a cosmic designer, if you will, for the, uh, various features of the biological world. There are many problems with this style of argument. These are called design arguments. I guess they've been around a long time, but most famously associated with William Paley, who put these forward as an argument for the existence of God. So for a start, the designer hypothesis is supposed to make the observations of intricate natural structures less surprising. But how does it do this? For instance, the watchmaker hypothesis in the watch example that Paley is, comes is straight from Paley, the watchmaker hypothesis makes the appearance of the watch less surprising because we know that there are watchmakers. We already know that such things exist. And we know that they have the required skills to make watches. And moreover, we know that they have good reason to make watches. They can sell them, make money out of it. But we know none of this about the proposed cosmic designer. So if we find intricate structures like that in nature, the analogy breaks down. It's not like the watch at all because we don't know whether there are eye makers. We don't know that anyone has got the required skills to make eyes. And moreover, why on earth would they do that? Right? We don't know any of that. All of the things that we do know about watchmakers, we don't know about the cosmic designer. Moreover, the probability of such a designer is low. The designer hypothesis only makes things more mysterious. So for instance, suppose I told you that the watch was made by some utterly implausible line of thought. Magic fairies made the watch. That doesn't make it less mysterious that you found a watch. It makes it even more mysterious. Where did the magical fairies come from, right? And 
So unless you already have established the existence of a designer, so for instance, you already believe in a, a, a creator of some form or other, then this doesn't help at all. So rather than being an argument for the existence of a creator, it's more work for the creator to do if you already believe in one. So such biological design arguments were criticized long ago by uh, perhaps most famously by David Hume, the great philosopher. But once Charles Darwin and um, Alfred Wallace Russell and the theory of evolution came along, those design arguments were just indefensible. The theory of evolution showed how biological systems could evolve to be well adapted to their broader environment. And this can look to the uninitiated as if they were designed for such purposes. So we now have a story from straight from evolution about why various uh, parts of the biological world are so well suited to their environment, right? Because in a nutshell, the failures are discarded due to natural selection. The most fit are selected, the, le the less fit are not selected. And so in the fullness of time, what you see are the successes. And that's the explanation, I take it, uncontroversial. That's the explanation for the biological adaptions we see in, uh, in nature. But design arguments curiously didn't go away after David Hume had pointed out philosophical problems with it. And then Darwin and Russell uh, gave an alternative explanation for the, the, the biological complexity we see. Design arguments still lived on. And it turns out in the modern guys, the design argument revolves around physics rather than biology. So I'm just gonna give you just a hint at some of the, the, the so-called fine tuning argument as it's come to be known. It turns out that certain physical constants such as the proton electron mass ratio and the fine structure constant, doesn't really matter what these are, but the proton electron mass ratio is just, protons are much heavier than electrons. And had the electron been a little bit heavier than it is or a little bit lighter than it is, that mass ratio would be different. But it, so it turns out that the proton electron mass ratio, fine structure constant, and there are many, many others to these physical constants they just turns out that they couldn't have been very different from their actual values. And had they been different from their actual values, the universe would not be able to contain carbon-based life. Um, it looks like these constants, the values of these constants have been fine-tuned for carbon-based life. Lo lots of reasons for this, but one that, that it props up is in order to get carbon in the universe, to, to have carbon-based life, you need carbon, obviously. And for there to be carbon, you need second generation stars. That is stars that are built out of the stardust of first generation stars um, to build from hydrogen to helium and helium up to carbon. And if you only had first generation stars, you wouldn't have any carbon. And so in order to get the universe in such a state that you can have second generation stars, you require these many of these constants to be fine tuned to their particular values. Since, and this is, this is kind of curious in its own right. And a lot of physicists have comment on this. It's, it really does look odd that you feel like these constants just take some value or other, but when you investigate and see whether the constants could have been too different from where they are, you find that the universe that is produced is radically different and wouldn't have carbon-based life in it. So here's how the argument's going to go then. Since there is carbon-based life, universe as we find it is extremely unlikely and in need of explanation. What could be the explanation for finding ourselves in such a fine-tuned universe? Well, back to the culprits or candidates, if you like, for the, the uh, biological design argument. An intelligent designer. That's one answer. Um, this answer, however, has most of the same problems raised for earlier by David Hume. It doesn't suffer the biological problems that were raised by the theory of evolution, but it still has these general philosophical concerns. For instance, this is only an explanation. It only helps if we 
believe that there's a pretty good chance that there is such a designer and that such a designer would be the kind of uh, character that would like to build carbon-based life. But we have no reason to believe any of that. Apart from prior commitment to such views, for instance, in um, Christian theology, you might think, well, if I'm a Christian, I already believe in such a designer, and I believe that such a designer thinks that humans are special, so really does like carbon-based life. So I already believe all of that stuff. But this is supposed to be an argument to get a non-believer to believe in some grand designer. And it doesn't work unless you've already got some prior commitment to there being such a designer. So, Think of it this way, just to get a, a, an idea of the what this fine tuning means. Think of hitting the bullseye on a dartboard with a randomly thrown dart, not some expert dart player, but you just randomly throw a dart and it happens to land in the bullseye. You're entitled to ask, how did that happen? It's very improbable that the dart would land right in the middle if it were randomly thrown. One explanation would be that it wasn't randomly thrown, it was thrown by someone who is very skilled at darts and they were aiming for the bullseye. That would be the kind of designer hypothesis. But it's not straightforward to get from fine tuning to improbability here. So the claim is that the universe is fine tuned and I take it that that's a fact about the relevant physics. I, I, I take that as hard to deny that there is this kind of fine tuning. But what we require in order to get this argument going is that the current universe is improbable. It's fine tuned, therefore improbable. But it's not straightforward to get from the fine tuning to the improbability. Um, as I said, evidence for fine tuning is hard to deny. But next step in the argument is that because life permitting intervals are so small, our universe is improbable. So think of just one of these constants, the electron proton mass ratio. That constant could take any value, any positive value. And yet it has to be in a very, very small interval in order for there to be carbon based life. But the problem is compared to the whole positive real line, any interval is small. So the intuition that these little interval, the life permitting universe interval is really small, it's hard to support that. And there are some technical moves you can make in mathematics. I won't go through the details here, but it turns out to be extraordinarily difficult to move from the claim that there's fine tuning to improbability. Uh, there are various technical problems uh, in the probability theory you know, to, that seem to block that move. Um, So it's like hitting a bullseye on a dartboard from the, the required 2.37 meters with a randomly directed dart. Um, but with this interval compared to the whole dartboard, like that's, that's what you're thinking with the dartboard analogy, the bullseye is very small compared to the whole dartboard. But the problem is compared to infinitely many real numbers that this, this, this uh, fine, particular fine-tuned constant could take, any interval is small. And so you don't get this, the, the analogy to work with the, the, in the way that you would like. It turns out very difficult to say that the probability of hitting this particular interval is small. Therefore, we need an explanation for that. Okay. So the next step in the argument is to ask for an explanation of the improbability. So let's set aside the technical difficulties that I've just alluded to. I, I think they're deeply problematic myself, and I can maybe talk more about that in question time, but the details do get a little technical there. So just, just skip fast past that for the moment. So the next step is to ask for some explanation of this improbable universe that we live in. So if my dart hits the bullseye, you'd like to know why that happened. And as I said, one explanation would be that it wasn't randomly thrown in the first place. It, it was set up that way. It was an expert dart player aimed for the bullseye. That would be one good explanation for why the, you find this dart in the bullseye. 
Um, but let's just pause for a moment and think, do we really even need an explanation here? Not all improbable events require explanations. Okay, just because something's improbable doesn't mean that there's an explanation required. So I don't know how many words there are in this talk, but there's some number, which is the exact number of the words I will utter during this Zoom meeting. We don't need an explanation for that. Don't think Mark Colvin uttered exactly whatever the number of words is in the Zoom talk. I need an explanation for that. I don't need an explanation at all. At all. Why? Because we don't think it's significant or that there's no explanation to be found. It's just, that's just the way it is. There's some number of words I was, going to, uh, I was going to say this evening and it happened to be whatever it is. That's the end. So improbable things happen and sometimes that's just the way things are. Compare this to the dart case. Again, in the dart case, you don't think that. You, you, you're kind of inclined to think that if I threw a dart at the dartboard, and I can tell you right up front, I'm no dart player. So if I had thrown that dart and it hit the bullseye, it would be surprising. And you would, you would like to have some explanation. And the following doesn't seem like a good explanation here to say, well, it had to land somewhere and it happened to land there, the end, right? Why isn't that a good explanation here? Well, in part, because we know a little bit about the games that are played with the dartboard and there's something very special about the bullseye. It's deliberately designed to be a high score in the game of darts. It's deliberately designed to be hard to achieve. And so achieving that, it already has some purpose attached to it, right? You already think, wow, that's odd. The dart has hit the bullseye. There's something special about that. Whereas whatever the number of words in my talk this evening, Whatever that number is, there'll be nothing special about it. So that seems like a case, the dartboard does seem like a case where you would require an explanation for something improbable. The number of words in my talk does not seem like a case where you'd want an explanation, even though it's improbable. Whichever number it is, it's kind of improbable because it could have been any number or at least a, a, a whole bunch of different numbers either side. So what do we say about the fine tuning argument? Is it more like the dartboard case, which requires an explanation, or is it more like the number of words in this talk that doesn't require an explanation? So granting that a life supporting universe is improbable, um, why think it's in need of explanation? Well, because life is salient to us just like the bullseye is salient to anyone who plays darts or anyone who's ever heard of darts, right? You don't even have to be a dart player to know that the bullseye is something special in darts. And life is something salient to us. So in versions of this argument that conclude that there must be an intelligent designer or a fine tuner, there are some implausible assumptions about the designer having preference for living things enters in at this stage. You have to import that uh, assumption. Just having a designer doesn't explain why there's life in the universe, right? Because if you had a designer who hated carbon-based life, going to design this beautiful universe and the last thing they want is carbon-based life in this universe screwing things up as we have, right? That's not what you want for your universe. You want it to be pristine and beautiful and keep the damn carbon-based life out of it, right? Under that assumption, now it's even more mysterious why we've got carbon-based life in this universe, right? So the only way that you reduce mystery by introducing a designer is if you also introduce assumptions about the designer. The designer likes carbon-based life. But what reason have you got to believe that? But again, what's so special about carbon-based life? Is the existence of carbon-based life especially significant from a scientific from a point of view? I mean, it's important to us because we're carbon-based life, but is it particularly important, significant from a scientific point of view? Is it really screaming out for explanation? Put the point slightly differently. The universe is also fine-tuned for other things. For indeed, it's even more fine-tuned for things like the emergence of heavy metal music, 
right? To get heavy metal music, you've got to have carbon-based life and carbon-based life that learns how to play distorted guitars and so on and so forth, right? Much, much harder to design a universe which has heavy metal music in it. So if you think that what you should be doing is explaining really improbable things, uh, that's something that we could ask for explanation, but no one thinks that. No one thinks that the designer is a heavy metal head, right? But that's, there's, a, there's an argument sitting there waiting. Does the emergence of heavy metal music also require an explanation? What would such an explanation look like? As I said, a, a heavy metal god. An alternative to the design hypothesis, which is popular amongst physicists, is that life in the universe is not so special if we had lots of shots at it. Right, so think about the dartboard again. Even a, a, a poor dart player like me, if I had lots and lots of shots at getting the bullseye, surely I'm going to get lucky every now and again. Even if I'm just throwing no better than random at the board, it's got to land in the bullseye somewhat, some, some stage if I have enough shots at it. So if we had lots of shots at the universe, then we're going to get lucky and get the carbon-based life sometimes. And we just happen to be in one of the lucky ones. That's the thought. It's called the multiverse hypothesis. And it's a hypothesis taken very seriously by many physicists that there, in some sense or other, which are difficult to spell out, but in some sense or other, there have been many, many shots at the universe, each with different physical constants. So reset the physical constants, run the thing. Carbon-based life, yes or no, run it again, run it again, run it again. And the point is that you'll eventually get carbon-based life at some stage or other, just like I would get a bullseye if I played darts long enough. It's like infinitely many darts thrown without witnesses and only bring in a witness when you get a bullseye. That's the idea, right? If I can just keep throwing the dart, the dart at the dartboard and only tell you about it when I get the, the bullseye, that's crucial, right? So now you see the bullseye and you think, wow, that's curious. How did he get a bullseye? Well, either I'm a much better dart player than I'm alluding to, or I've had lots and lots of goes at it. There's a, a selection effect here. So in the universe case, if you run the universe over and over again, and when you get carbon-based life, then you've got observers. But in the other ones, there are no observers. So let's suppose for a moment that carbon-based life is the only form of life you can have. I, I don't think that's right, but let's suppose that for a moment. Then whenever you've got life in the universe, then uh, they're going to be observers to sit around like we are and wonder, how is it that we are here? But in the empty universes with no life, there's no one to wonder. So that's kind of like throwing your dart at the dartboard, missing the bullseye, but no one saw it. Good, no one saw it, I'll go again. No one saw it, go again. Then when I get it, I call everyone into the room, right? That's the idea here. There's a selection effect. You only see the successes if the success in question is the existence of carbon-based life. Sometimes this is called the weak anthropic principle. And note the similarity with observations of organisms suited to their habitats in, the, in light of evolutionary theory, right? Again, evolution doesn't say that organisms become adapted to their environments. What you get with evolutionary theory is random mutations, most of which are going to be uh, bad for the organisms in question, but then they get selected against. So what you see at the end of the day are the success stories, not the failures. Same thing with the uh, weak anthropic principle and the selection effect for universes, if there are multiple universes. As I said, it would be like me imposing some selection effect with the dartboard by only letting you see it when I succeed. So now you might ask a question about this multiverse, hypo multiverse hypothesis. You might think we've overstepped the bounds of science here and now we're straying into speculative metaphysics. 
and that that's a bad thing. You can't think of experiments to confirm the multiverse hypothesis. And we certainly can't observe any universes other than this one. In fact, we can't observe all of this one. We can only observe a certain portion of the, the, the backwards light cone of this one. So you might think, okay, well, that we're trying to explain something about this universe, the fine tuning that's in this universe. And what we do is we hypothesize many other universes of which this is one. And in fact, the number of other universes needs to be really quite large for this to do any explanatory work for us. And you might think a naive thought here is, well, science is about the observable. If you can't observe it, then it ain't science. This is some sort of speculative metaphysics or whatever. But that's just not right. A great deal of science goes beyond observation. Indeed, that's a large part of the job of science. So I see no special problem here. Um, as a hypothesis that there is a multiverse. In my book, the boundary between philosophy and science is fuzzy one at best. So if you like, you can say the multiverse is a particularly good scientific hypothesis, um, or it's a particularly good philosophical one. It doesn't much matter to me which of those. If you think it's philosophy, uh, it's philosophy that's well informed by the science, or it's science uh, I, I don't know how one is supposed to draw a clutch sharp boundary between the two in any case. So this is why, at least, I, I'm not endorsing this argument. I'm just trying to outline this argument and why um, what you might think of as a simple refutation of it doesn't work and why scientists, many physicists, take this line of argument very seriously. Okay, so let me wrap up here. Given the fine tuning, what are we going to say about this? Let me just lay out your options and I'll leave it for you to decide your own preferences here. First, you can deny the fine tuning evidence. As I said earlier, I, I don't think that's uh, a terribly fruitful way forward. The, the, there are incre incredible sort of accounts of the number of constants that have been fine-tuned and exactly how fine-tuned they are. There's a lot of modeling going on behind this and by, by physicists. It really does look like the universe is fine-tuned. So that's one option, just deny the evidence, but I, I, I find the evidence myself rather overwhelming. Accept the evidence, but deny that universe, that a universe is improbable and in need of further explanation. Um, as I hinted at, I think there's, there's uh, some promise in that line of thought, because I think the argument from it, from fine tuning to improbability is has never been spelled out to my satisfaction, at least. Third option, accept the improbability claim, but not seek further explanation. You might think, well, that's just the way things are. Universe had to be some way or other, the constants had to have some value or other. They just happen to have these values and lo and behold, those values are the values that give carbon-based life. End of story. Nothing more to be said. Or you can accept the improbability claim and seek further explanation. You might think that this is one of those improbability claims that does require explanation. Like, so it's like the dartboard rather than like the number of words in my talk. And if you take that line, then it looks like the two main hypotheses, there, there, there are others I think one could invent here, but the two main lines of thought, I think if you've, if you've followed, us, followed the argument thus far and accept the improbability claim and seek further explanation, then the intelligent designer with a curious desire for carbon-based life, you've got to specify that, not any old designer, as I said earlier, will get you over the line here. It's got to be a particularly curious designer that that you know has this thing about carbon-based life and maybe heavy metal music as well like who, who knows there there's a multiverse either temporally or spatially separated I, I didn't say much about this so let me just say a little bit about what it would be to have multiple shots at the universe right so you've got the big bang 
And you set the physical constants in such a way that in some of the big bangs, you just get a big bang, and a big crunch immediately, hardly any time for the universe to expand. Other ones, it keeps expanding and never comes back. Others, it's right on the brink and the, everything in between. So you could have lots of shots at the universe in that. So it's, I've got spatially and temporally in scare quotes there because it's not really temporally, nor is it spatially, because space time is tied up with a particular universe. But it's kind of temporal like. You have one big bang, one big crunch, and then another big bang, another big crunch, and then another one, another one. So it's, it's intuitively you can think of it as one after the other time wise but you can't really say that because time is bound to each of the universes or it could be spatially where they're parallel universes sort of separated by some space-like thing but not really space because space is tied up with each of the individual universes but that's how you the, the two possibilities for the multiverse but it doesn't much matter how you do that as long as according to this line of thought, you have a large number of shots at the universe with a resetting of the physical constants each time. And at some stage or other, you will get very high likelihood that you'll get lucky and get carbon-based life. And only in those carbon-based life universes will there be observers. So it's again, it's just like the dartboard case where I only call you into the room when I've had a successful throw and I keep the failures to myself. Those are the options, as far as I can tell, and they're all the options. So choose wisely when you decide what you fit kind of inclined to think about fine tuning. And um, thank you for your attention. And there's a, a few uh, uh, pieces that you may wish to follow up. If anyone's keen on this, there's some uh, um, examples like Barrow and Tipler, the Anthropic Cosmological Principle is a just a, a really interesting book full of the various physical constants that needed to be fine-tuned. And uh, as long, along with references to Hume's criticism of the biological design arguments and so forth. Thank you.